published papers in the peer review literature already with two more submitted. Um, and there's gonna be a lot more to follow um, where there's already a few drafts that are coming. Um, he's also given several um, presentations, including three contributed talks at American Chemical Society meetings. Um, and for this work, he had just recently received was a 2023 Outstanding Researcher Award um, in the Department of Chemistry. Um, Vinayak was also named in 2020 an Outstanding Teaching Assistant. So he received the Outstanding Teaching Assistant Award um, then. And that I want to just kind of highlight sort of in, in this last bit in that uh, Vinayak is an excellent teacher. He's an excellent mentor. Um, one of the things that I don't think he'll talk about today that, that he does in all of his free time um, is that he's developed a series of workshops that he hosts online um, for a worldwide audience. Um, so he really sat down and thought um, about these workshops. These workshops are geared towards teaching um, people how to do science sort of at the convergence of chemistry, of, of theory and modeling, and of computer science. Um, he's had these workshops live and then also recorded them. They're available on YouTube um, under the Chemistry with Code moniker. Um, Vinayak has 1,200 followers. So go and sign up. So I don't know, how do you say it? Subscribe, subscribe. Yeah, do, do the Vinayak. YouTube thing um, for, for Vinayak. Um, he also took that and uh, had a collaboration with the Center for Applied Energy Research and the Office of Undergraduate Research here at UK and hosted a two Saturday workshop for undergraduates and graduates to learn Python program. So um, in addition to being an excellent researcher in the lab, um, Vinayak has also honed his skills as, as a teacher and as an educator. So um, with that, it's my uh, pleasure to introduce Vinayak. I'll remind everybody that this is the public portion um, of, of the defense. And so what we'll do is Vinayak will give his talk um, and then afterwards, the people in the audience can ask questions, um, and then we will close the doors and, and hold the private defense. Okay. All right. This is the way. Ready. Good. Thank you for the kind introduction. Uh, without uh, further ado, let me jump right on to my dissertation. So my dissertation is titled Developing uh, and Deploying Data-Driven Tools. Uh, data driven tools for accelerated uh, design of organic sem semiconductors. To give a gist of what you're going to see in, in this talk is the tools that I have developed, which use computational methods, machine learning, AI stuff, and how those tools can be used by chemists, material scientists, to assist them in designing uh, better organic semiconductors. The first, uh, the first two chapters of my dissertation give an overview of uh, organic semiconductors and computational modeling methods. Uh, what I'm going to do over here in this chapter is to use this and lay the foundation of uh, my research that you'll see in the upcoming chapters. Organic semiconductors have widespread application and they are not something science fiction. My, even my phone over here has uh, organic uh, light emitting diode embedded in it. And uh, there's a few solar cells out there, organic based flexible devices, and they have wide applications. And the reason uh, the research in this field is quite prolific is because you can change the molecular structure of, of, uh, of, of these uh, um, uh, organic conjugated molecules. By changing that, you change the molecular properties and thereby tune. Uh, in the properties. And these could be done in the lab by simple alkyl substitutions uh, or introducing a heteroatom like your sulfur in this carbon uh, framework or changing the framework itself by you can have a five member doing or go to a four member doing and make the changes in here. Uh, so all of those would give different properties as at, at the level of molecule. But the challenge you, uh, in organic semiconductors is not just limited to the changes that you can make in this molecule, mm -hmm. but also how they uh, arrange themselves in solid state. And each uh, over here, I've shown five uh, representative examples of uh, packing. There can be more. Uh, but each of uh, these arrangements would give us a different uh, property. Even though we have the same molecule in these different arrangements, 
they would give us different uh, material properties. So the, the space to be explored is large. If we just think of combi having combining these uh, 16 molecules on top with, uh, with, with, the, on, uh, with the material arrangements at the bottom, we end up with 80. Not all of them would be possible, but it's a large space even with the small molecules. And uh, if you want to understand how properties, uh, the structure relates with properties, we need to explore a large material space. In, in the talk, I'll be referring to molecules. If, we, if When I refer to molecules, I mean a single molecule that you see over here. And if, if I mean material, it's molecule plus one of these packing arrangements. Okay. So, uh, if we want to explore the space, we want to, uh, uh, let's look at uh, a timeline for that exploration. Uh, this is a hypothetical one. You would start with molecular design uh, in, in mind. You, you read articles and then come up with uh, the changes that you can make at the molecular level. And in the lab, you might take a week uh, to design, get the material, which is uh, the solid state part of it with packing. And from there, Again, a hypothetical uh, time timeline over here, let's say a week to get the material property out of it. And this is the experiment, experimental trial and error approach. And in a month you would have maybe two uh, materials over here uh, and the property is estimated. But even for 80, 80 of the combination that I showed before, it'll take a while to do it. So can we speed up this process? There has been uh, computational modeling methods uh, that can be applied to it. Uh, you can use Newtonian equations uh, and uh, model it. But if you look at the experimental accuracy and the accuracy from molecular dynamics, it's a large difference over there uh, for, for electronic properties uh, per se. And then let's say we introduce some quantum methods into it too. And we improve the accuracy, but also it takes more time now to get to the experimental accuracy. Uh, to get very close to experimental uh, accuracy, we would need to use density functional theory, at least, which has some uh, compromise on time scale over here, but we get some somewhat close experimental accuracies. So if we use density functional uh, based methods, which, uh, uh, which you might have seen if you read some uh, chemistry or computational uh, papers like PBE, B3Lib, HSE. Those are DFT-based met uh, methods that people use to uh, evaluate properties. So if we now change from experimental and uh, experimental trial and error approach to a computational approach, how would this timeline change? We could go from a material to its property in a day. Uh, because computers can do the job faster. And we, though DFT takes a while, it takes about hours uh, uh, to do it. And we can think of uh, a day, less than a day, you get material property. The challenge from uh, uh, mole going from molecular design to material is a little bit hard. And uh, even though we, we would use computational techniques, it's hard to find uh, the exact uh, packing that you saw over there. So it'll, it'll still take a week irrespective of whether you do synthesis in this hypothetical timeline or do it, explore it uh, with computations. With uh, increasing demand, uh, with, with cheap computing resources nowadays and uh, uh, the emergence of AI and a lot of data and data management protocols like uh, Making it find making the data findable, accessible, interoperable, and reusable. It's the fair principle that people have been using these days to manage the data, and that has made an, that has uh, evolved into some the fourth paradigm of science, which which uses all this data that is there and discover new materials using that data. So, using machine something like machine learning models, or artificial intelligence. Uh, and have, if you have a lot of data, what you could do is predict the properties directly from the data that you have. Uh, example over here is, uh, let's say we want to predict Y, which is the property, and X1 and X2 are the inputs that we have or descriptors for the material, um, but we don't know what W1, W2, and B would be. But if you have large number of X1s and X2s and the corresponding Ys, we could train a machine learning model, which 
tries to figure out what the W1s, W2s, and Bs would be. So given a new X1 and X2, it would predict a new Y, which would be the corresponding property. And this, uh, this is very, very much abundant in our day-to-day -day use. We have Siri, we have Alexa. All of those are machine learning models that use some data, maybe from Wikipedia uh, or Google uh, web pages, and uh, do a specific task. But if we could use our DFT-based data, that is uh, our, our, for our material, and then train machine learning models, we could achieve an accuracy close to our density functional theory, but at time scales which are close to molecular dynamics or semi-empirical methods. So this brings to the hypothesis of my uh, research, which is if we have machine learning models which are trained on our diverse data sets, uh, the machine learning models could provide reliable predictions of properties. And if we look at this timeline of computational approach and try to replace it with machine learning approach, uh, I hypothesize that from going from material to material property, we could do that in less than a minute. And uh, going from molecular design to material, it may take an hour. I'll, I'll show why it is a little bit hard, but it's less than a week. So we had the initial timeline of two weeks from experimental trial and error approach, which we could essentially go down, which, which we could essentially bring down to an hour or so in uh, finding new materials and its property. So this is uh, what my hypothesis is, and I'll show you how uh, I validate that. For first, we need a lot of data to train machine learning models. And uh, uh, thus this chapter, I'm, I'm going to show you how that uh, data was generated. The challenge, uh, as, as I mentioned before, is going from material to crystal, uh, molecule to crystal, or material, and then to property. The first part is the crystal structure prediction problem, given them a molecule predict the structure. The second part is material prediction. And also there's another thing that is a molecule itself as a molecular property. So we need to also look at how good the molecule is, but we could save some uh, compute time and only look at part of the molecule, which is uh, responsible for most of the electronic properties. So for molecule, we can look at a chromophore, which is, uh, which is more uh, relevant electro uh, for electronic properties and calculate the property. So to do this, we, uh, we need information at uh, the X1s and X2s, the input would be our data for chromophore. For this prediction, uh, if you want to go from crystal to a uh, material property, we need information from our uh, crystals and information from molecules to do the other prediction as well. So we need modularized data with, for crystal, molecule, and chromophore. And in order to get that, if I just have a crystal structure, what I could do is extract a molecule from here, and I have molecule and uh, crystal relation over here. And from, from this, we can then identify the chromophore part so we can get chromophore. And to predict the properties, I can use uh, density functional theory to get the properties. And this is how uh, the, I planned of creating the data set that is needed for the machine learning pipeline. To get the crystal structures, uh, Former graduate student Alex I had uh, downloaded uh, about 350,000 structures from uh, Cambridge Structure Database, which has uh, a million of experimental structures. I used that data and then uh, scaled it down to around 56,000 uh, crystal structures, which did not have any metal atoms and satisfied a, a bit more stringent criteria for uh, organic semiconductors. From there, uh, for, for those 56,000 crystal structures that I have, it ends up with 47,000 unique molecules and around 38,000 uh, unique chromophores. And the smallest, the smaller chromophores look like this, just two membered uh, rings in here, but the largest can go up to 24 benzene rings in a molecule. And benzene ring is just the six membered ring. So we, we can have 24 of those in there. Now that I have those molecules, uh, crystals, and chromophores from here, I would need the data and uh, the materials property and molecular property. To do that, I uh, have designed this workflow where I can take the SIF file, which has the information for crystal structure, 
and clean it up a little. Make sure that there's no disorder when you determine crystal structure, you end up with some disorder. We move that disorder, make sure the structure is wide, no missing hydrogens and all of those things. From there on, I divide it into crystals, molecules, and chromophores, and run high throughput calculations on each of those uh, each of those parts to get uh, the data that, that I need. And all of this data is made uh, accessible through a web interface and uh, the workflows do incorporate conversion checks, make sure it is running okay. If there are any errors, try to fix it. And this brings to the first tool that uh, I would like to show, which is Ocelot. And Ocelot stands for Organic uh, Crystals in Electronic and Light uh, Oriented Technologies. This is a database of all the high throughput calculations and those 56,000 crystal structures that you saw. Uh, uh, it's accessible on this uh, uh, URL. And you can search for molecules in here. For example, it's searching for a, mole um, a, a molecule which is called pentacene. It'll show you a list of uh, molecules and then you can look at properties that you want for these uh, crystal structures. And this is all in real time. It's fetching the data from, uh, from the database and displaying it to you. Uh, and then you can even make plots or export the, export the data uh, to, to, as a uh, Excel file. That, that has descriptors for HOMO energy, which is highest occupied molecular orbital. Uh, optical excited states, ionization energy, and uh, about 2,000 descriptors uh, in this database. It took a while to generate it, as, as, as I showed before. DFT takes a while uh, to run calculations, and this was like millions of, cal uh, millions of calculations, so uh, about 1.5 human uh, hours. So you can uh, even search for crystals with same molecule or same chromophore. And it shows you like an e-commerce website where you'd have related products at the bottom. Uh, and that feature is also in, in, in this uh, uh, application that I have developed. It's a web interface. So we started with this uh, timeline of two weeks, experimental trial and error approach. And if you use computational approach, we can uh, make this one day for material property materials to material property and uh, for molecular design to material even computational techniques take a week or so so let me just keep this as a time as the base timeline for more uh, for the rest of the talk so how does ocelot over here change uh, the timeline in fact it doesn't it just helps you uh, get more intuition about molecular uh, design. If you look at articles that are published, they may they may be at uh, they may may be using different parameters for calculation or uh, experiments done with different solvents, for instance. But Ocelot provides all of the data which is consistent to all. So that helps with uh, molecular design and uh, gaining some chemical uh, chemistry intuition or material intuition for design. <clears throat> So these uh, computations that, that I showed you are complex and tedious. Uh, and uh, if someone who's, who made the material yesterday and asked me to run some calculations, I would be like, oh no, I have my uh, defense schedule today. I can't do it. Even though it was one day for going from materials to uh, property, there are some other practical things going on. So there's also some communication delays and other things. So how can we mitigate this? Uh, to do that, I have uh, designed the second tool, which is Ocelot X, which does all of the high throughput calculations uh, using just click of buttons. And as long as you have access to a high performance computer, you can just get this uh, package from me, just put in the, uh, the SIF file and it will run all the calculations for you. And if you want to make the data more public, uh, what, what I've done is you can upload it back to the Ocelot, uh, Ocelot for uh, access again. We can update the website and show the molecule or, or the crystal that you have in the calculations. Going back to this timeline, uh, the thing of going from material to material property would take a day, but you would need to find a, a different uh, person to do it but now the same person doing the uh, experiments can go forward and do the uh, calculations and get material properties with Ocelotex. 
there is uh, the timeline shows material property, but uh, we also need to look at molecular property because if you don't have good molecules, we can't expect the materials to be great. So an experimental approach would take a week. And uh, if uh, we would replace it with uh, computers again, computational approach, it would take a day. So can we now speed this up uh, with machine learning? And that's what this chapter I'm going to show you about is about it, wherein I do prediction of electronic, uh, optical, and redox properties with machine learning. I have this huge data, a uh, data set with uh, 25,000 chromophores that we looked at. So this data set contains uh, properties including ionization energy, electron affinity, relaxation energy, and so on. There are 15 uh, descriptors that you can think of, and these would be the Y for, uh, for our machine learning models, and X would be these molecules. Because this is a, a diverse data set with uh, up to 100 atoms, um, I hope that the machine learning model trained over here would be generalizable enough, and uh, we could uh, predict properties over large uh, chemical space or material space in, in this case. So as I said earlier, we have a molecule, which is a 2D representation of it. And we want to predict the property, the Y, the 15 property that I uh, showed in the previous slide. So we have Y and we need those X1s and X2s. So how do we convert a molecule that looks like this to the X1s and X2s? So for this purpose, I use something called graph, uh, graph-based uh, machine learning models, which convert this molecule into a graph where the atom is converted, is, uh, converted to a node. Uh, and the bonds between the atoms are the edges in the in this graph. And each of these edges and the edges would have properties like whether it's a single bond, whether it's a double bond, and so on, while uh, the atoms would have atomic properties or what is the hybridization of the atom, what atom it is, and that information embedded into it. And that passes through this uh, graph neural network blocks and leads to some transformed uh, graph. And the way it does in, in this each block is you have those features, type of atoms and bonds. So it tries to pull in features from the neighboring atoms, uh, like a social networking over here. So the atom is doing social networking and it gets influenced by the surrounding. Uh, so that's what is happening. And then that atom information is updated and finally, you get a transformed graph from, from this input graph. And that is then uh, going to give you the X1s and X2s for, for, the, for the prediction. And this thing is called uh, message passing neural network uh, of sending or uh, interacting with the other uh, atoms or the nodes in, in the molecule. And if that was too comp, uh, if, though it's uh, sophisticated, this is what it does in simplified version. You have a molecule, you put it to the black box, the, the thing that I showed before, and it will give you a property. And we can use uh, a different property, the 15 different properties, and train the machine learning model over here so that the time we give it a new molecule, it will give us the property corresponding to it. So this is uh, how it looks for the property prediction. Uh, R squares, some of them are good, some of them are bad. R squares in here, but uh, does a pretty good job on some uh, properties that are of interest over here, like ionization energy, electron affinity, the singlet energy gap, or the triplet energy gap. Uh, I would like to uh, just focus on this too, uh, a whole reorganization energy, given a molecule, we can predict this uh, whole reorganization energy, and I'll come back to this in, in the uh, next chapter, why this is important. So the, this tool looks like uh, uh, the thing shown on the, on, in this video over here, available online, open access. All you need to do is draw a structure in there just with clicks and select what property you want to uh, est est uh, want the model to predict, and it'll predict it for you. And it's just like in a second or so, you get the property. This is available on, on this uh, website over here. So uh, with this, uh, the timeline of uh, going from molecular design to molecular property, which would take a day, 
Uh, now with the machine learning model that I just showed you would take less than a minute to get to the property. And how does this affect the initial timeline of uh, going from molecular design to material property? Uh, Ocelot over here provides data for molecules which are present in the Ocelot database. But what about molecules that are not present in the Ocelot database? You can use now the machine learning uh, uh, pipeline, which will give you molecular properties at, uh, for molecules that are not in the Ocelot database and help you uh, come up with new design principles. And also you can validate your intuition whether adding uh, alkyl chain would be good or adding a uh, hydro item would be good. Now, now that I've shown you how to go from molecular design to mo a molecular property in a day, can we do the same with material uh, to material property? Uh, sorry, in a second, in a minute or so, can we do that for material to material property as well? Uh, one of the critical uh, pro property uh, for organic semiconductors is charge carrier mobility. And what I'm going to show you over here is using machine learning model to make those predictions uh, quickly. Uh, for charge transport, we can assume that th there's a charge on this molecule and we want to push it throughout uh, to the end and there's transport of, uh, of charge. And this can be modeled with um, uh, different theories or different um, uh, models that people have proposed. One is the hopping model. It hops from one, one molecule to the other molecule to the other molecule. Or uh, this is more classical way of thinking. Or you can have the band transport where you have quantum mechanical way of uh, approaching this that the electron would just like tunnel through it. Or there's an intermediate one which is considering it hops and also it uh, has this band like transport and that's called transient localization. Irrespective of, uh, of what uh, model we use to uh, describe this charge transport, the electronic communication between two molecules is, uh, is critical and that's called electronic coupling. And if you do our DFT based uh, estimates, it would take a day or so to get all electronic couplings in a, in a crystal. And from there on, we could use the hopping, hopping weight. We can calculate hopping weight, which would eventually uh, be used in uh, calculating whole, uh, the mobility. Uh, for this, you would see that all, most of the parameters are constant except the lambda. And lambda is the reorganization energy, which is the energy that you would spend to move from this configuration where it's charge on this molecule to that molecule. And that's called a reorganization energy. And over here, we neglect any uh, effect of the surrounding onto it. So that's the lambda and V is electronic coupling. So if you want to uh, do these calculations with machine learning model, I already have a model as I shown in the previous uh, chapter where lambda was the reorganization energy. I did highlight that. So given a molecule, I can predict the reorganization energy. So what is now left is uh, getting the electronic coupling. So to get the electronic coupling, uh, it's a little bit more sensitive to positions in space. It's not just you have a 2D representation of a molecule, but you also have uh, a 3D uh, stuff to take into account. What, where is uh, where's the atom position in space? So this uh, machine learning model does the same similar thing as uh, the 2D uh, representation did, but now takes into consideration the positions and does the prediction. This model over here is trained uh, on machine learn on, on on a data set which is uh, of, of the uh, which has 438,000 uh, DFT computed electronic couplings, and there is a way to predict two properties, which one is homo homo coupling, which is for hole transport, and lumo lumo coupling for uh, electron transport. It could be used in estimating electron transport. These models do have a pretty good R square value when compared to DFT uh, predictions and uh, mean absolute error of uh, uh, three milli electron volts. And uh, to validate how good they are in respect to DFT, what I've done is I've taken two molecules and moved them uh, vertically and uh, computed electronic couplings with DFT, the orange and blue is the machine learning. You can see the, the trend is pretty good beyond 3.5. Uh, 
and below 3.5 does not look so good. The reason being uh, these are the data has only structures from experiments and experimentally it's very uh, hard to find structures where it goes beyond 3.5. That's because of the physics. It'll be not too close uh, to get these parts. But if we move it laterally, you see that the trends are pretty much well reproduced with machine learning and getting this uh, whole whole plot with machine learning takes about a minute while DFT would take about a day for me to do all these calculations. So now that I have electronic coupling and uh, the reorganization energies from, from the molecular machine learning uh, chapter, I, I could essentially use that and do the prediction over here shown is uh, submitting of a SIF file, which contains the molecular, the material. Uh, it's the material. And from there on, uh, the, the code automatically extracts uh, the dimers and calculates electronic coupling. So this is the structure. And over here are the dimers. And there's the electronic coupling you see. And using this electronic coupling and the uh, reorganization energy, you can plot uh, the uh, charge carrier mobility in different directions. And this tool is also open access and you can click on these view uh, 3D buttons and it will show you the two molecules that it has calculated coupling. Using this, I've screened uh, over 60,000 crystal structures from the 350 uh, things that we initially had from that I initially got from a uh, former graduate student, Alex I. And from there on, uh, this screening, as it takes less than a minute to do, uh, I, I found out about 40 potential candidates uh, for organic semiconductor application, which have uh, charge carrier mobilities greater than that of amorphous silicon. So I've shown in this chapter how we could go from material materials to material property, uh, which took a day for uh, com traditional computational techniques. With machine learning, I can uh, get the prediction within a minute. So the only part left in this timeline is uh, going from molecular design to material. And that's, uh, that's chapter six, uh, where I'll show you uh, something about interatomic potentials for crystal and organic semiconductors. So the challenge in going from molecule to uh, crystal uh, generating structure in general is the geometry relaxation part. And the relaxation is uh, is what needs a large number of forces. For example, if, okay, if this is a molecule and we want to, let's wait for a while, it's a GIF, it load, let's see. If we randomly place atoms in space and we ask it to relax, and we use density functional theory, what it's going to do is it's, it's going to calculate forces on each of the atoms and try to move it in such a way that forces are minimized. And this takes a lot of time. This over here is a, a way of getting a relaxed molecule. But if we imagine going replacing the atoms that you saw over here with molecules itself and placing them in, in all these uh, positions and then relaxing them, it'll take a while to do all of this. And that's why DFT-based relaxations takes uh, take like few hours to days and hinder the process of uh, getting uh, a crystal from molecule. Uh, uh, it will take a it will take a while, like a, a week or so, to do it. So, oops. But if we if, but if we have a machine learning model that would give me the forces acting on each atom, and not or spend a lot of time on DFT-based uh, forces uh, acquisition, I could uh, speed up this process. And uh, that's what uh, I'm going to show you over here is if you have a random molecule and place it in one of these positions, can we relax them faster and uh, estimate which, uh, which of the structure would be more, uh, more stable in, and seen experimentally? For this, I use a machine learning model, which is again, similar to, to the 3D uh, message passing a neural network that we saw for electronic coupling, but it also considers periodicity over here and gives me energy forces on each atom and also the stress on the entire cell. 
this model is trained on 2.5 million crystal configurations and uh, the results for these look uh, pretty decent with uh, energy predictions of uh, 0.023 electron volt per atom and this is uh, less than the thermal energy which is 0.025 so we are getting uh, cl close to experimental errors in, in this part over here with thermal energies and uh, I will show you how these model, this model can be applied for relaxing a crystal structure. If we start with a crystal structure of tips pentacene over here, uh, these are the lattice parameters and the volume is 961. If I use density functional theory, it relaxes the structure uh, as I showed for a molecule, it does the same thing with crystals. And this is these are the parameters that I get. If I use machine learning, I get similar volume close by, uh, oops. so close by this alpha, beta, gamma, I think it's not showing well, uh, uh, close by lattice parameters and the relaxed structure, the one in, uh, the one in yellow over here is the DFT based one and the blue is uh, the machine learning. You don't see a lot of difference in there, but if you look at the time it takes for machine learning, it took a minute or so to do this, but on uh, but for DFT it takes like four hours for the same relaxation. And this tool for relaxation is available online. Uh, over here I show generating one random crystal structure, uh, which is the, the video is speed up four times. So you'll see it happening pretty quick. Uh, you have a crystal structure. I generate one random crystal structure and we can relax the crystal structure Though this is four times speed up, you'll see it, it is a little slow, but it takes less than a minute to relax the structure and give you uh, a relaxed structure over here. And also the energy corresponding to it. So if you want to determine what would be the most stable uh, crystal structure, it would, it would involve relaxing maybe hundreds or thousands of these initial geometries and finding out which one is uh, of the lowest energy. And that would be the stable structure. So, uh, so going from molecule, molecular design to materials with the machine learning model I just showed would reduce this, uh, this time from one week and uh, probably to an hour or so if we have to scan a large number of uh, initial geometries. So this is, uh, this is how the timeline would be shorter. To conclude, I've shown you how uh, we can use machine learning models to predict molecular properties, uh, material properties, and also relax the structure. Uh, and this validates the uh, initial hypothesis that I had that if we have large enough and uh, diverse data set, the machine learning models could uh, actually uh, do a pretty good job in uh, speeding up uh, the process. So I started with this initial timeline of uh, two weeks to get to property. But with the tools that I've uh, designed, we could accelerate the discovery and come up to an hour or so to gen, uh, come, uh, reach uh, to material property from molecular design. The Ocelot database and models have uh, widespread users now. Uh, it's about 2,000 users who are using it from 48 different countries. So what's in, what's, uh, what's in the future for Ocelot? Uh, right now, uh, we, I would be interested in generating equilibrium uh, crystal structures. Uh, I just showed you one structure and how, how we could relax it, but we could uh, do that for thousands of uh, initial structures and find the you know, most stable one and try to include dopants or uh, interaction with device surface, uh, device substrates. Right now, everything is in pristine, uh, pristine form and there are no dopants. And it would, it would be good to add this validation step in, in between. Uh, right, all I've shown is data, model, and predict, but uh, use experimental data to validate it and then close this loop would be the, uh, the thing to go about uh, for us a lot in future. In all, these, uh, these are the publications that have resulted from this work at, uh, and these are at various stages of publication. Some of them are published, some of them are under revision, and some of them submitted. In addition to uh, 
what I've shown over here. There's a lot of uh, fantastic collaboration that I've been involved with and other projects. And uh, even those uh, publications are in, at various stages in of uh, uh, publication. All this work would not have been possible without funding from a National Science Foundation. And uh, the compute resources were from Exceed and Center for Computational Sciences. Uh, and I would like to thank uh, Dr. Chad Risco for his advice uh, and guidance throughout my PhD uh, and both in science as well as uh, life in general. And I would and thank you, Dr. Risco. Uh, I would also like to thank my committee members, Dr. Anthony, Dr. Beck, Dr. Graham, uh, for, for the advice and making sure that I'm on track for my, for my PhD, and uh, Dr. Johnson for agreeing to be an outside examiner for this uh, defense. There, there are a lot of collaborators whom I worked with uh, from NYU, Stanford, Princeton. I would like to uh, thank uh, Dr. Bhaskar Ganpati Subramaniam from Iowa State University, who has been of tremendous support for the machine learning projects that uh, I've started working on and most of the things that I've, you have seen now. Our, uh, a big thank you to computational staff, uh, Vikram and Bhushan, uh, without whose help all these calculations or setting up of the website would not have been possible. And former members and present members at the Visco Lab, uh, whom I have collaborated with, uh, worked with on various projects. And uh, thank you for making uh, the lab so fun and to work with and all those fruitful discussions. Uh, with, uh, with that, I would like to thank you uh, for your kind uh, attention, people here in person and also on, uh, on, on Zoom. I would be happy to take up any questions. Thank you. Okay, questions from the audience. Yeah, so that's pretty good. Um, I think you could touch on um, my key question, which is really about viability. Um, what do you envisage when it comes to viability with experimental companies? So that's really critical with all the stuff that you uh, so the question is, uh, how do I validate it and what experimental output is, is required to validate uh, all these things? What are the okay, so what are the benchmarks in validating this uh, models? So uh, what I've done for validation is use internal validation. So the data set, what is generated is split into a training data set and a testing data set. So I train the model on the training data set, which is uh, a big chunk, like 80% of the data. And the 20% of the data, which, uh, which is assumed that it's as diverse as the training data. And from that, the, the values that, you have, uh, that I've shown, the R squares, the mean absolute errors are on that part, the test part of the, of the data set that model has never seen before. And that's the validation that I've done. Uh, for these models, but I envision uh, for experimental data, I would envision the similar properties like what is the absorption maximum, for, for instance, uh, singlet uh, energies that, I've, that, that you see here, or maybe ionization energy, some uh, uh, electron spectroscopy for that to figure out what the ionization energy was. Some, some data like that would more validate uh, these models. Uh, for, from the experimental side of it. But what I have done over here is use internal uh, data, which was not seen by the model before. Right. So I did want to report some of the experimental values, for instance, kind of like uh, Fanta energies, for instance, um, of some of the materials that are in existence, right? Um, and incorporate that into your um, machine learning program software, mm -hmm. such that when people put in their stuff mm -hmm. okay, and try to design something new, if you're looking at what's the, the state of the art, what are the benchmarks of the state of the art, how do this compare to the state of the art? Okay. Is this something that could be done with your system? So the question is uh, can we look at experimental data 
and uh, can we say, okay, this is uh, experimental benchmark, this is uh, the Thevi benchmark, and this is the machine learning benchmark uh, that uh, for these models. And that can cert certainly be done, but what we need is the data to be at, uh, consistent throughout. So if we have some data, maybe in maybe one solvent, chloroform, all that some data is in chloroform solvent, some is in uh, acetonitrile, and some is in uh, some other solvent. In that case, uh, as long as as the property that we are looking at does not depend on solvent, it's great. We could use that data and uh, use the models that we already trained and tweak, a, tweak it a little bit and retrain it on the experimental data. So now the predictions would be close to the experimental data. If uh, the thing that I showed before was a time, the accuracy and time, it was close to the DFT data because the input was DFT data. If the input was semi-empirical data, the accuracy would be lower because it's same as uh, semi-empirical. But if I have consistent experimental data, we could do that with uh, experimental data as well. I hope that answers your question. Yeah, that, that's fair. My last question um, is you excluded that all based on <laughs> yeah so the question is uh we have excluded metal based compounds and why uh so out of 365 k compounds mm -hmm. you picked to 6 k and then more than half right were excluded i mean i can see why you did that mm -hmm. <laughs> so, <laughs> so the okay. right. yeah. So, okay. so the so the question is why did we exclude metals? Uh, and go for discard more than half of the data that was initially scraped, which was thirty six, uh, three hundred thousand plus uh, structures, and we just ended up with fifty six thousand. The reason for that is the initial thing that we checked was make sure it had. Uh, a 3D geometry and stuff. But if the 3D geometry had missing hydrogens in it, the crystal structure was not good enough in that case. Uh, we had to discard it because we are doing computational <laughs> stuff on that. And if we have missing hydrogens, we don't know where to add hydrogens in a high throughput way and make sure that the crystal structure as the is, is good enough for these calculations. And the other thing that we did over there is the initial thing only looked for, I think, one component systems, but uh, one component meaning there's only one type of molecule. But it so happens that if we go uh, and screen it more thoroughly, we have solvent molecules in there. So we don't want solvent molecule because it creates a little bit complications for us to, uh, to deal with. Like if we, we are right now looking at pristine part of it, right? So just pristine uh, uh, crystals. So those were the other things that messed up with that. And then we have disorder in the system. And we need to, uh, all of this is in a high throughput way. So the code needs to pass that, make sure that disorder and everything is removed. Sometimes the code fails. So all of these things uh, are the reasons why it came to like 56,000 from uh, 300,000. Uh, but you're also talking to a metal coordination chemist if he wants to know why you don't have gold. <laughs> <laughs> Other questions? Uh, so you said that you found 40 uh, crystals that should have high probability. Mm -hmm. But is that just a prediction or did you go back and computationally validate that? So those are just predictions. Uh, from the machine learning model using the electronic coupling from there and then using the other model to predict uh, reorganization energies. So those are just the models. I didn't uh, go ahead and do the calculations again. Uh, those 40 are the ones that have mobilities uh, greater than amorphous silicon, which is one centimeter square per volt per second. Uh, also, uh, those 40 have lower anisotropy in uh, electronic coupling. So the couplings in different directions are different between two different molecules are more similar. Uh, but there, from those 60,000, I think I ended up with 300 or so molecules which had higher mobility than amorphous silicon, but there's large anisotropy. Okay. Uh, 
but these are the ones that have less anisotropy and uh, are great, are somewhat similar to mobility. But I did not do the calculations, DFT based ones on those. Okay, so I think with that, we're going to close the, the public part of the defense. So let's thank Vinayak again for a nice presentation. On your way out, you can grab some coffee and stuff just quickly.